Uh, hi, everybody. So today we're moving a little bit away from what we've been doing recently. And I actually want to give you guys a practical approach to strokes, uh, in especially in our context. Um, now, when I say that, I don't mean uh, that you get different types of strokes in a rural area, uh, but just sometimes some of the challenges that we face and also just how you go about having a look at a stroke. The reason being, sometimes we may not have access to CTs, we may not have access to radiologists, we may not even have access to uh, thrombolytics. Uh, those of you who work in district hospitals, uh, CHCs, uh, clinics, you will know this. And uh, even some of us who work in regional and tertiary centers uh, in public health especially, may find it particularly difficult to actually treat these patients. So uh, let's stick around for the round. Right. There's a few videos as well, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, let's go. So the first thing is brain basics. Now, everybody who's already looking is like, ah, yeah, blah, blah. I don't want to learn about all of this. I passed my anatomy and I had to forget about it after that. Now, the reason why I bring this up is to actually just point out something very simple because a lot of people don't realize it. And even when you've been learning about anatomy, you kind of forget about it, all right? So this is why I wanted to bring it up. When you're looking at the outside of the brain, so when you're looking at the exterior of the hemispheres, your blood supply is from the middle cerebral artery. So even if you can't remember every single one of these, you have no idea what any of these are. The middle cerebral artery is the one, the main branch, okay? That supplies the outer area. So if you have Broca's area, right? And your patient can't understand, you know it's the middle cerebral artery. If you have Wernicke's area and your patient can't talk, then you know you've got middle cerebral artery. If your patient can't understand and can't talk, you've got the middle cerebral artery. If your patient is having problems with sensation, or your patient is having problems moving, the majority of it will be because of a middle cerebral artery infarct, okay? Now, if your patient is having problems in the temporal area, auditory area, cannot hear, cannot discern, you're right, middle cerebral artery. If your patient is having problems with vision, it could be middle or posterior, but we'll get to that in a little while. But majority of the time, it's not middle cerebral, but it can be. Okay. So your patient comes to you in a clinic, can't move their left arm, can't move their left leg, they have a drooping face on the right hand side. They have a left sided, uh, uh, sorry, a right sided middle cerebral artery infarct. Immediately, you know this. The reason being, remember, below the level of uh, what is it? That's when you have the crossover. All right. So above that, generally the face will have your, um, watch more call it, uh, will have muscle weakness on the same side as the infarct. And then the quadrilateral side is affected on the lumps. Now, this is the most common presentation that we do get, and we see it all the time. So immediately, you know, it's middle cerebral artery, exactly which branch, exactly how extensive, you don't know. But remember, outside of the brain, talking, hearing, moving, feeling. Say it with me. Middle cerebral artery. Got it? So if you have no idea what the Rolandic or pre-Rolandic arteries are, where they are situated, you have no idea how to even spell them. Don't stress about it. Remember, these are branches of the middle cerebral artery. So this leaves two other arteries, the anterior and the posterior cerebral arteries. So the inner side of your hemisphere, just around your ventricles, is supplied by your anterior cerebral artery and all of its branches. Now, those of you who are going to become neurosurgeons and radiologists and neurologists, please take note of this. You need to know all of these branches, okay? So what will your patient present with when they have these? Now, these are the more tricky ones, okay, where generally you have more of your frontal lobe symptoms. Uh, you have uh, thought disorders, when can mimic psychosis. Uh, there's a lot of things that it can, and you can get sensory and motor deficits as well. But generally, it's not as severe as what we see on the middle cerebral artery. And then when you come to the posterior cerebral artery, this is when you start getting, and of course, metabolic issues with your uh, hypothalamus and things like that. Pineal glands are affected. There's so much that can go on from there. I don't want to get into the big specifics. I'm just trying to give it, um, you know, basics. And then you can see the posterior cerebral artery again with vision, 
all right so that's where you're having a problem okay so that's what you've got to remember and also the midbrain but we're going to get to that now so let's go through it again outside of the brain speaking understanding moving feeling seeing hearing middle cerebral artery and if you can remember that diagram, you can even be more specific. So you've got no radiologists, you've got no CT, you've got nothing going on, but you already know. And the majority of yours are middle cerebral artery infarcts, unfortunately. So it depends on the extent of it. Right? Come to the other side. Patient is presenting with other symptoms, not necessarily uh, classical symptoms or non-traditional symptoms. Then you start thinking, oh, anterior and posterior. Now, anterior and posterior are not as easy to make out. Clinically, you can but it's not as common, okay? But in any case, we'll get to that in a little while. I want to show you guys this. So let's look at those that come off the interior carotid uh, or internal carotid. Okay, so remember your internal carotid doesn't give off branches until it reaches the brain. Uh, and it's your external carotid that is actually giving your facial artery and your temporal artery and all of that, all right? So your ophthalmic artery for your optic nerve and retina. So sight, anterior cerebral, frontal pole personality, higher functions, all of that. Anteromedial, cerebral cortex, and anterior corpus callosum. Again, you're talking about metabolic disturbances, and you're talking about a bit of movement and sensation. Middle cerebral, frontoparietal, anterotemporal, just as we had a look at. And you can see that the amount of, it takes up the major amount of space. Okay. Now, the posterior or comes of the vertebral system, right? So you've got your vertebral artery that affects your brainstem. So if your brainstem is affected, so you're starting to have issues with blood pressure, heart rate, breathing rate, things like that. That's when you know you're having a problem. Posterior, inferior, cerebellum, your cerebellum, balance, gait, um, what you call all those classic cerebellar symptoms. Uh, basal goes to the thalamus, posterior cerebral, auditory vest vestibular structure. So it starts coming out more again towards that side. And the medial temporal lobe, visual occipital cortex. Okay. So ophthalmic nerve, optic nerve and retina, medial temporal uh, artery, you're coming towards your visual occipital cortex. So it's nice to know all of these things, but the truth is that we don't see many uh, anterior and posterior cerebral artery uh, CVAs it's clinically. You can, if you really remember all of this, you can. Remember the majority of them are going to be the middle cerebral artery, which we pick up normally, all right? Now, once your patient is diagnosed or suspected to have a CVA, even some of your psychotic patients who don't present with typical signs of psychosis, and we go for a CT, younger people, things like that, you may actually find that they have one of the other blockages, but they aren't as common. Okay, sorry, let me just hide this. Uh, right, there we go. So what are the symptoms? So here we see the traditional symptoms. Sudden numbness of weakness of face, arm or leg, especially unilateral. It's very uncommon to get bilateral, but I have seen it before. We once had a patient with bilateral massive bleeds, absolutely massive and presented with both sides, uh, you know, being uh, having bled. Uh, the patient was misdiagnosed uh, because he had severe hypertension as well. And uh, I still remember the case because I had about six months worth of meetings about the patient uh, because the, the only treatment that was given was actually to drop the BP. And unfortunately, patients who have uh, severe hypertension are quite reliant on that blood pressure to get blood past the ischemic parts. So once you start dropping their BP, the ischemia actually worsens. That's the thing. So you've got to be remember that. And unfortunately, as ischemia work, it worsens, cerebral edema worsens, and you start pushing the brainstem through the foramen magnum. So they tend to cone much more quickly as well. All right. So sudden altered mental state is a common thing that we hear. You know, a patient was fine. Suddenly, they couldn't talk. They couldn't walk. Everything didn't seem okay. All right. Sudden aphasia, inability to talk. Memory deficit, spatial orientations, perception difficulties, sudden visual deficit, diplopia. Now, this is difficult, especially if it happens in isolation, because this you've got to remember. Now, again, you're looking at your ophthalmic arteries, you're looking at your posteriors, and it's not always that obvious because it could be a primary ophthalmic problem, but it could also be a CVA. So it's one of those where if your patient has sudden visual deficit, it's good if you have the facilities to have a look in that eye, see what's going on. But most of us who are not trained very high, highly in ophthalmology 
we won't be able to say specifically, yes, listen, this is something in the eye or it is the brain. So we need specialists very often to be able to tell us. But luckily, it doesn't happen very often in uh, isolation. It tends to happen with the other symptoms. All right. Sudden dizziness, gait disturbances or ataxia, especially when you're talking about posterior uh, cerebral artery, these are the most common ones that you get. Sudden severe headache with no known cause, which we've come across before. So that's quite typical of subarachnoid hemorrhages that we've been talking about quite a bit, you know. And uh, I hope to do the headache presentation again with you guys. I'm not sure if I've done it before. We've been doing this now for so long. I've actually forgotten what I've taught you and what I haven't, which is quite bad. So if I repeat myself, please <laughs> forgive me. So let's have a look at some of the non-traditional symptoms. Loss of consciousness or syncope. Now, we would generally do ECGs. We would look at uh, how the patient is, fine, you know, whether the patient has signs of uh, pulmonary embolus, acute cardiac. There's so many things that it could be. So it's not common that you would diagnose a CVA purely from this. Now, in saying that, there is a little caveat. In the case of CVA, we do get uh, what we call a cerebral ECG. We do get changes on the ECG, which are related to cerebral uh, some uh, cerebral signs, oh, sorry, uh, cerebral bleeds, raised intracranial pressure, things like that, which I haven't really covered with you guys. And I think it may be a good idea for me to do that so that you guys can have a look. So there is a way that we can look at the ECG as well and then actually be able to diagnose that this is actually intracranial rather than cardiac. All right. Generalized weakness, very nonspecific. Shortness of breath, very nonspecific. You wouldn't jump to a CVA immediately. Sudden pain in the face, chest, arms, or legs is also not a common symptom, but it can happen. Seizures. So any patient with a new seizure, this was actually one I wanted to talk about. So any patient with new onset seizures, you should assume to have a CVA. That patient deserves a CT scan if it's not immediate, but it should happen at some point, okay? Uh, ideally, I mean, if you're working, for example, in a private institution, you should do this, you should do the CT scan immediately, have it reported on immediately, all right? Falls or accidents, please, we do not send everybody who's had a fall to uh, have a CT scan. Sudden hiccups, again, lots of causes, uh, what you call it, uh, both the... Um, diaphragmatic and central. So don't just rush to do a CT. It's one of those things that can be, is generally differentiated later, or differentiated later on on CT. Sudden nausea, more co a, a nausea and vomiting are more commonly associated with raised intracranial pressure. So it can happen. Sudden fatigue. Oh God, I think all of us would actually end up going for CT scan. So... <laughs> <laughs> Please do not see anybody who's got fatigue um, for that. And sudden palpitations, again, I'll try and do a presentation on the cerebral and uh, ECG, uh, uh, what you call it, ECG uh, findings with uh, intracranial uh, abnormalities. I'll try and do that. It's quite interesting, actually. And of course, altered mental status, which uh, falls under here. So even a slowly developing CVA or micro ischemia can eventually just lead to a slow decrease in an altered mental status. Okay. Now, these are all the mimics. Okay seizures. I'm not going to get into all of this, but we're just going to have a look at it and see. So seizures very commonly can mimic, especially post uh what's called TOTS paralysis. So patients post-seizure may definitely have signs of a CVA, and they can be very, very convincing. You can have all the symptoms of a CVA, but allow the post period to pass and then see if the symptoms persist. Syncope, again, it's, it's one of those things that can mimic a seizure when the patient uh, is revived. Meningitis and cephalitis, depending on where the patient has uh, the majority of the swelling. Complicated migraines, uh, uh, you know, they don't really s mimic a CVA per se, but they can mimic a subarachnoid slash CVA. It can make you think that this is possibly the cause rather than just a migraine. Brain neoplasms and abscesses simply because they are a space occupying lesion. So space occupying lesions are a big uh, part of this, you know. So space occupying lesions are not uh, CVAs, but they can present exactly the same depending on where they are found. So exactly the same with epidural epi uh, and subdural hematomas. Again, these are space occupying lesions. Subarachnoid he hemorrhages, which we've talked about before, are not CVAs because they don't occur within the uh, uh, within the brain itself. These are now exterior to the brain and uh, well, you know, below the sub uh, below the uh, arachnoid matter. 
Okay. Hypoglycemia also can present with uh, symptoms of CVA, but one of the easiest to pick up because hypoglycemia will more commonly give you seizures that may then give you post ictal uh, evidence of a CVA. So you, once you check the sugar and you treat it, it should be okay. Hyponatremia, all right, uh, which again, uh, now hyponatremia, the reason for this, uh, because you've got a lowered sodium count in your vascular space, what happens to your, 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 your brain cells is that they actually try to equalize. So they themselves uh, start absorbing uh, what you call it, fluid from the intravascular space uh, in order to uh, also lower their uh, sodium levels. Because remember, they're trying to reach homeostasis. So this causes quite severe cerebral edema in hyponatremia. It's one of the reasons, and we'll get to it later on when we talk about diabetic emergencies, uh, why we don't, uh, but you know, even when we talk about electrolyte disturbances, why we don't try and correct hyponatremia very quickly, uh, because then you get the opposite happening. You get brain shrinkage, you can get uh, cerebral uh, what you call it, uh, the, the brain cells bursting. There's quite a few things that can happen with hyponatremia. Hypertensive and capillopathy, generally you'll find severe hypertension, and generally you don't have the classic signs, you know? Uh, so that's basically where that comes from. Hyposmotic comas from uh, what we uh, what you call HHS, uh, hyposmotic hypo, hypoglycemic comas, so high glucose levels and things like that. Wernicke's encephalopathy, alcoholism, malnutrition, very common. So they tend to get ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, and confusion. All right, labyrinthitis from the ears, but this will also mainly give uh, vestibular symptoms. All right, so dizziness, uh, difficulties with hearing, and a cerebellar stroke can also pre present the same. Drug toxicity, like phenytoin, carbamazepine, two commonly used drugs, lithium as well. All right, so it just depends. Patient will have other evidence of toxicity though, and a history of use. Bell's palsy, very commonly seen in young people, especially when they've you know, been exposed to any sort of cold or any sort of nauseous stimulant on that facial nerve. And then they'll immediately um, start getting this uh, uh, drooping of the face. Now, the one way to actually have a look at that, generally with Bell's palsy, the patient can still lift their eyebrows up but can't move the rest of the face. Not always, not always. But generally, in my practice, I've noticed that if I ask the patient to look up, they'll be able to get the corrugated effect on their forehead, but not necessarily uh, the rest of the that side of the face. So that was one thing that I used to use to differentiate it. Uh, Meniere's disease, okay, so the history of recurrent episodes of vertigo, tinnitus, deafness, things like that. But again, they'll present more with the ENT symptoms, and that's it. Multiple sclerosis, generally more gradual in onset. It's not a sign of an acute CVA conversion disorders, which are more in terms of your psychiatric disorders. Okay. All right. So when should you begin treatment? Now, all of us who work in public service will look at this and laugh, uh, especially those of us who work in Mediterranean, because we know we can't get anywhere close to this. And uh, so ideally, you should start intervening within 10 minutes. So the patient becomes an orange coat, should activate the stroke team, should they be on. I must be honest, we have never had a stroke team. Head CT within 25 minutes, maybe if we push the patient directly through the wall. So this <laughs> is our idea. complete head CT interpretation. It takes us two hours to find the radiologist, forget about <laughs> We're getting it interpreted in 45 minutes. And if Dr. Moses is listening to this, I am sorry, but she knows I'm right. And uh, of course, you thrombolize within one hour, if possible. And admission to the stroke unit should occur within three hours. Now, these are ideas, but I must be honest. There's two reasons why we never get to these ideas. Number one, sheer lack of staff. Number two, sheer load of patients. Number three, lack of resources. So there may not be CT scans. There may not be radiologists. There may not be anybody available to be able to assist you. And this is one of the things that really hampers us. And also late presentation. Unfortunately, in South Africa, there is a very, very uh, common issue with patients presenting well after four hours. And it becomes very difficult to treat after that. Now, uh, for those of you who maybe were here a few, uh, who, who have been with us for a few years or who are working in hospitals, you may know there's the ANGELS initiative. And the ANGELS initiative is actually to try and improve this. So they've been at our hospital for three years. And in those three years, we haven't gotten one patient to the ideal. Uh, and that's for a lot of factors. Now, some uh, hospitals are doing it. For example, in Gwelezine and Pengeni, they've got a few that they've rescued. Uh, 
uh, I know in Durban, Johannesburg, where the Angels Initiative has really taken off, and they've got the resources in some of the big hospitals, they have been able to do it. Unfortunately, for us at Paladin, anyway, we haven't. And if you have a chance, go and look at the Angels Initiative. It's actually quite a thing to look at. Okay, so that just gives us an idea of the times and things like that. Let's move on. Okay, so this is an intracranial hemorrhage that you can see over here. But, uh, you know, I know people struggle with CT, so we've got something from uh, two good sources, Radiopedia, and I think the other one is EM Med, and they're going to teach us a little bit about, uh, yeah, looking for all of these things. Hello again, this is Frank Gaylard from Radiopedia.org and today we're going to be discussing imaging of acute ischemic stroke. In most instances, cerebral ischemia results from a thromboembolism, either from the heart or from the carotids. Rarely it is also due from paradoxical emboli through the patent foramen ovale or from aortic atherosclerotic disease. This is seen most commonly in the setting of either angiography or cardiac surgery. In situ thrombosis within the cerebral circulation is seen either superimposed on a pre-existing arteriosclerotic disease or in the setting of arterial dissection. Imaging of acute stroke is performed either with CT or MRI. The majority of imaging of acute strokes is performed with CT, although MRI is in fact more sensitive the reason for this is mainly to do with availability of MRI and the ability to get a patient in and out of the CT scanner rapidly without the concern for MRI compatible resuscitation equipment. The mainstay of imaging of acute ischemic stroke is with a non-contrast brain, although increasingly in the setting of ischemic strokes this is being supplemented with CT angiography and CT perfusion. Let's focus on the hyperacute findings in ischemic stroke. This can be divided into two main sections. One is direct visualization of the clot or embolism, and this can be seen immediately, or early parenchymal changes, which can be seen as early as within one hour of onset of symptoms. The hyperdense artery is a well-known sign on non-contrast CT scanning and represents direct visualization of the clot within the lumen of the occluded artery. It relies on the fact that clot is hyperdense when compared to normal flowing blood. However, this depends on the age of the thromboembolism. Flowing blood typically has a density of approximately 40 Hounsfield units, although this varies depending on the hematocrit and state of hydration. Acute thrombus is not significantly denser than this. However, with time, it becomes progressively more hyperdense, reaching densities of up to 100 Hounsfield units. Fortunately, the majority of ischemic strokes are due to thromboembolism, which is caused by clot forming either in the carotids or within the heart. As such, the clot that eventually embolizes and occludes intracranial circulation has been present for some time and is significantly hyperdense. In this case, we can see the right M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery is much denser than any of the other arteries are seen. In this second case, thromboembolism has occurred to the top of the basilar artery, which is much more dense than the internal carotid arteries at the same level. We can confirm direct visualization of the clot by performing CT angiography, which allows segment, which appears hyperdense on non-contrast imaging, to appear as hypoenhancement or a filling defect on CT angiography. The same direct visualization can be seen on catheter angiography, in this case, the M1 segment is occluded and we can see collateral flow across from the anterior cerebral circulation to supply part at least of the middle cerebral artery territory. The two regions that are affected most profoundly in acute occlusion of the supraclinoid internal carotid artery, usually the M1 segment, are the basal ganglia, particularly the caudate head and the lentiform nucleus, and the insular cortex. The basal ganglia are supplied by lenticulae striate, perforating arteries, which are end arteries, and such no collateral circulation is available to them. The insular cortex, although capable of receiving collateral circulation, is the most distant part of the cortex from the anterior cerebral or posterior cerebral artery. When ischemic, 
grey matter becomes hypodense and the grey-white matter differentiation becomes lost. This can be seen as early as within one hour of occlusion and in up to 70% of patients is seen within three hours. The rest of the cortex, because of the collateral circulation, tends to be more delayed in demonstrating changes on CT. In this case, we can see a hyperdense middle cerebral artery with vague hypodensity of the surrounding cortex of the temporal pole. This is a little more pronounced on the slice more superior where there is blurring of the lentiform nucleus and loss of the grey-white matter differentiation of the insular cortex. This is difficult to appreciate on standard windowing of non-contrast CT, but can be made more conspicuous by narrowing the window. Here we can see loss of the grey-white matter differentiation, particularly affecting the insular cortex. This is nonetheless subtle, but is worth seeking, as in many cases the hyperdense artery will not be visible, and this may be the only sign available to confirm the presence of an acute infarct. In this case, CT perfusion was performed, which demonstrates prolongation of Tmax and mean transit time, but no significant difference in cerebral blood volume or cerebral blood flow. The region of ischemic penumbra, which is the area which has not infarcted and is potentially salvageable by reperfusion, on CT perfusion is taken to be the mismatch between cerebral blood flow and prolongation of Tmax, in this case uh, shaded in, in green. This patient went on to have an attempted clot retrieval, which unfortunately was unsuccessful. A scan performed a few days later confirms evolution of the middle cerebral artery territory infarct. MRI is extremely sensitive to acute ischemia, with changes seen on diffusion-weighted imaging and apparent diffusion coefficient maps seen within a few minutes of onset. These appear as bright areas on diffusion and dark areas on ADC maps. As mentioned before, MRI is usually not used in the very acute setting as it imposes too great a delay in attempting to treat the patient either with intravenous thrombolysis or intraarterial thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy. In summary, the imaging of acute cerebral ischemia revolves around either detecting the clot or detecting early parenchymal changes. This is most commonly done with... Okay, so um, I know not the most exciting video in the world, but doctor gave us quite a few important things over there. I was quite astonished by the MRI because I, I must be honest, in my training, we never came across MRIs all that often. Uh, I know you guys are more exposed to it now. And uh, it was so amazing to see that it can be shown up after such a short time. So we've got one more video and then we're done. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Let's start it now. Detection of subarachnoid hemorrhage on CT is critical to the care of the patient since it can be the first and only sign of a ruptured aneurysm. But you need to be aware that the findings of subarachnoid hemorrhage can be very subtle on CT so that you will examine the scan appropriately. When subarachnoid hemorrhage is suspected as the cause of headaches, a good place to begin your search on CT is the interpeduncular cistern. This space is at the level of the midbrain, and as its name indicates, it lies between the two cerebral peduncles. This space is normally filled with low attenuation cerebrospinal fluid, so when the triangular cistern is visible because it's white, that means it's filled with blood. You should also carefully examine the ambient cisterns lateral to the midbrain where subarachnoid hemorrhage is visible in these two cases. When blood involves the posterior fossa but extends no higher than the ambient. That I really had it. And cisterns, it suggests what is called perimesencephalic hemorrhage. In those patients, the bleeding is frequently not due to a ruptured aneurysm and may be venous in origin. The clinical course may also be more benign, but it is still necessary to exclude a ruptured aneurysm since this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Carefully look at all the cortical sulci as well, since frequently this will be the only sign of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. This patient's CT scan demonstrated a small subarachnoid hemorrhage in a single sulcus that was confirmed on a flare MR scan. The CT scan on your right is from another patient with a small subarachnoid hemorrhage. Notice that the asymmetric high attenuation in this case is less sharply defined 
compared with the case we just saw and shown here on your left again. The conspicuity of the hemorrhage is dependent on the quality of the CT, the technique used to create the CT images, and the slice thickness. Hemorrhage is usually more apparent on reconstructions of 1 to 2 millimeter. For example, notice how much easier it is to see the small subarachnoid hemorrhage in this case when you look at the 1 millimeter reconstructions of the same data set. The image on your left is the usual 5 millimeter reconstructions, and while that is standard at many sites, it can make the high attenuation of a small subarachnoid hemorrhage less apparent than the thinner sections. The middle and right images are both 1 millimeter reconstructions of the same data and both more clearly demonstrate the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The reason that high attenuation blood is more difficult to recognize on thick sections is that high attenuation is offset by low attenuation of cerebral spinal fluid when they are both included in a large voxel. The blending of high and low attenuation can make the voxel resemble the surrounding brain and therefore much less apparent. We always view CT on axial images, but in patients with suspected trauma or subarachnoid hemorrhage, reconstructions in coronal and sagittal views can be very helpful for the detection of the hemorrhage, as well as assigning it to the correct compartment. In this case, the high attenuation evident on CT in the right cerebellar hemisphere could be parenchymal but its location in the subarachnoid space is much easier to establish when the scan is displayed as a coronal reconstruction. Even though subarachnoid hemorrhage is usually the only abnormality evident after aneurysm rupture, in a small percentage of cases, aneurysm rupture can also result in intraventricular hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, or parenchymal hemorrhage, with or without subarachnoid hemorrhage. In this case, blood was evident in four compartments, that is, subarachnoid, subdural, parenchymal, and intraventricular after a rupture of a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. But in patients who present with parenchymal hemorrhage without subarachnoid hemorrhage, you should first consider the possibility of an underlying arteriovenous malformation, venous occlusion, cavernoma, or dural fistula. The enlarged blood vessels that supply an arteriovenous malformation or dural fistula, because they are usually on the surface of the brain, can be mistaken for subarachnoid blood on non-contrast CT. While the findings in this case resemble subarachnoid hemorrhage we've just seen, notice that the high attenuation appears to be within the brain itself rather than the cortical sulci. That finding suggests that these are abnormally enlarged blood vessels and associated with a vascular malformation rather than intracranial hemorrhage. Keep in mind that normal intravascular flowing blood will look whiter than normal brain due to its higher attenuation in those patients who don't have anemia. The catheter angiogram in this patient demonstrated a dural fistula with large draining veins. That finding accounts for the abnormal vessels that we saw on the non-contrast CT scan. So carefully review the CT scan for subarachnoid hemorrhage using multiplanar reconstructions and thin sections, since its presence can be a critical finding in the workup of patients with headaches. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's quite involved and it just shows you though. So next time you meet a radiologist, just be amazed by how brilliant they are that they are able to pick up all of these things, you know? So, <laughs> uh, and it's, I, I also enjoy this quite a bit. It's the type of thing you have to watch three or four times, maybe, uh, unless you have a very big brain and, uh, you know, you can actually pick it up. But the reason why I put it over there is because, especially for those of us who may be working in regional departments and don't have access to radiologists, you sometimes have to differentiate the subarachnoid from a CVA. So that at least gives you some idea of what it is. Okay, so what is our job? Uh, in the emergency department, we recognize it quickly. Between Within four hours, you can still do some. Beyond four hours, the brain uh, loss is quite bad. So time is brain, unfortunately, and beyond four hours, it's quite difficult. Stabilize, investigate the patient appropriately, consult appropriately. Uh, I should have added thrombolize if necessary, and we correct uh, patient disposition. So uh, where does the patient need to go? Is the patient going to ICU? Is the patient going to a higher center? 
things like that, right? So that's basically our job. So I hope you guys enjoy that. If you have any questions, by all means, please send them through. Uh, I don't, <laughs> uh, any any social media warriors out there, it's just a joke, please. Don't take it uh, too seriously, just something to make you laugh a bit. Uh, and anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have another session soon. Thanks, bye.